Hello, everyone. My name is David Rosenberg, and I am the Director of Product Marketing here at Acronis. Welcome. Thank you, our attendees and guest speakers, for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today. Uh, our session is sponsored by Acronis, with guests from Forrester Research and Aston Ventures. At first, uh, I want to make our attendees aware that our featured speaker from Forrester Research, Stephanie Belarus, had a family emergency. Uh, well, it's actually it's a good emergency, but she could not join us today. But it's also our good fortune to announce that in her place, Rene Murphy, uh, Senior Analyst, Security and Risk at Forrester Research, will be joining us today. So we are in good hands. Rene will kick off our session today by sharing her observations and um, analysis of the disaster recovery challenges facing IT leaders today. Uh, she will also touch on how cloud is transforming DR. From there, we will turn our session over to Mark Jameson, uh, the VP of Disaster Recovery Solutions at Acronis, who will briefly review Acronis drafts. Next, we will hear from Dave Benton, the VP of Technology at Austin Ventures in Texas. David will share some uh, of uh, the best practices Austin Ventures has followed while implementing and using a hybrid cloud-based business continuity and disaster recovery solution from Acronis or Nscaled at that time. Finally, we will wrap up with a short question and answer session. Please feel free to type any questions uh, you have into the Q&A or chat window, and we will answer as many questions as possible without going over time, of course. Today's session will be recorded, and all registrants will receive the recording via email after the session concludes. Well, and now, without any further delay, I will turn it over to Renee Murphy, Senior Analyst, Security and Risk at Forrester Research. Uh, whenever you're ready, Renee. You know, Stephanie couldn't be here herself, but I think you're in really good hands. To give you my background, I'm a Forrester analyst. I've been with the company for I'm going on my third year. And uh, prior to joining Forrester, I was a network engineer, a VP of data center operations, and both an internal and external IT auditor. So I would agree with David. You're in pretty good hands here. <laughs> So if we go on to the next slide, what we're going to talk about today is uh, today's DR demands and challenges. Disaster recovery, you know, it's, it's, it's really necessary, shall we say? I mean, we only need to look at the Sony breach to understand, you know, recovery is actually a really complicated process. And doing it well requires a lot of effort, you know, time, practice. And this isn't something you can shove off in the corner and say, we're not going to worry about it. And then using the cloud to transform DR. I mean, if everybody's embracing the cloud, why wouldn't we do it for disaster recovery? It might be one of the great applications of the cloud, I think. And then recommendations. So let's go on to the next slide. So what we know about uh, DR is that um, it is really impacting customers, right? We have a huge problem with you know, natural disasters, hacking incidences. Um, failed application updates, or even just massive power loss. I mean, when you think of all the things that can take down a data center, and believe me, it's kept me up at night, um, you, you really do have to understand, you know, kind of where the, the actual risk lies. So I'm an analyst that covers risk management quite a bit. And so for me, you know, DR is all about mitigating risk, you know, risk of availability, risk of, you know, your customers having nowhere to go. If you're in a banking industry, you know, you having, you know, your customers having access to their online banking is actually incredibly important. And you're not being able to deliver on that due to a disaster really isn't their problem. I don't think they're all that sympathetic about it anymore either. Yes, they have less patience for downtime. So as you can tell, there's not a lot of actual you know, sympathy going on for you. This is part of the business you really do have to understand. Let's go to the next slide. As business becomes more digital, and this is true, right, risk increases. So do you feel that the level of risk is increasing? If so, what is driving the increased risks? Rank the top three. So you can see that people who responded to this question say increased reliance on technology is causing them risks they didn't have before, business complexity to the organization, and increased the threat of cyber attacks. These are all really important things, right? But I think another part we have to think about, and because I talk about risk management a lot, and one of the risks I talk about is third party, you, reliance on third parties is becoming a huge problem as well. And then 
frequency of and intensity of natu natural disasters. I mean, the world may de deny climate change, but the fact of the matter is corporate risk managers are not. Um, and the interesting thing today, I think I just saw it in the, in the newspaper today, was that uh, the uh, film industry is saying that because it's so cold, nobody will go to the movies, and that's the reason why their revenues are down. And it's actually a, a reality. So all of that is really important. But, but listen, increased reliance on technology happens everywhere. And we can only bring so much of that in-house. We have to really start triaging what we can actually do ourselves and what we really should give up to third parties. So this, as businesses become more digital, there is more risk. And accelerating digital business means more critical systems. What percentage of your applications and data fall into the following tiers, right? Non-critical applications, 29%. Mission critical, 36%. Business critical, 36%. So as you can see, we're about equal in what we consider important. But what's interesting is two-thirds of what we do we consider to be critical, which means we really have to have a continuity plan that's you know, reliable and we can actually execute. And we need to have a DR plan for that data as well. When two-thirds of the data in the enterprise meets that requirement, we actually have a lot to worry about. As data center managers, certainly, as DR people, definitely, and as a business overall, this is something that should really keep us up at night. We can go to the next slide. And disruptions are actually all too frequent. When we ask people, what are the causes of your most significant disaster declarations? Oh, by the way, did you know one in three companies has declared a disaster in the last five, five years? One in three. So if you, if you look around a, a table the next time you're at a conference, know that you know, at least a few of those people at that table have had to execute a DR plan. But what we found is, you know, what is the most, what, how did you declare this? What was the thing that impacted you the most? I think what's interesting is it's operational failures. We want to say it's human-caused events, right? It's um, malicious intent, a malicious insider, a malicious outsider, human error. We want to say it's that, right? But it's not. Quite frankly, it's power failures. IT hardware failures, network failure, and software failure. That is where it's the operational stuff that we do every day. So I would say maybe we're hurting ourselves, but this is the reality of doing business, right? So as we're sitting there with not enough money in budgets, not enough people to actually do the work, all of that stuff, and you're looking at two failed drives on an array, and you think, you know what, I could probably get away one more week without touching that. Yeah, it turns out that's not usually how it goes. So that's an interesting idea, right? That idea that it's the operational failures. It's the stuff you do every day that's putting you at the most risk. And this is the stuff that's going to cause you to execute your DR plan, not this idea like Sony, I mean, Sony had to execute their DR plan, but what's interesting about that is they were one of, well, they're the only U.S. company to actually have their data wiped after someone went and stole it, right? They, their actual hard drives are wiped out. They really were in a disaster mode. And it took them over three weeks, I think, to just get the mail and stuff back online where they could function as a company again. Three weeks away from, you know, we had this horrible event and now we're going online live that's three weeks away for them. So I think that's really extraordinary, right? And for them, it really was the black swan. But for the rest of us, it's actually the operational failures. And as a technical operations you know, VP, I'll tell you, that's a rough one. It's a rough one to take, but I'll bet you that 90% of mine probably were regarding that as well. So people fat fingering commands, next thing you know the data center's down. It's really terrible stuff. But I mean, this is something we need to pay a lot of attention to. So let's go to the next slide. <coughs> They all have significant business impact, too. I'm going to beat on Sony a lot in this, in this presentation, but I, I, it's, it's the perfect example. We don't have very many examples where we're able to look at a company and say, you know, listen, you were struggling with this. You were wiped out. How long did it take to get you back? And, you know, and maybe you know, they should do some post-mortem and publish it to tell us, you know, hey, listen, we thought we were doing the right thing, but it turned out that this was way more complicated than we had at first maybe given it credit for. And that's the, that's the story of DR, right? It's never complicated until you actually need it, and all of a sudden it becomes incredibly complicated, right? As a result of your most significant disrupt disruption, which of the following turned out to be the greatest impact on your organization? Loss of employee productivity, 72%. Loss of employee morale, 37%. And loss of business opportunities, 37%, right? Customer confidence lost, corporate reputation damaged, um, you know, loss of partner trust confidence, uh, customer compensation. These are all things, but the, the thing they're most worried about is employee productivity, right? So if you go back to thinking about the Sony breach, they all kind of sat around. As a matter of fact, the IT department went and told Hollywood Reporter that, you know, people, the business keeps coming down and yelling at us because, you know, how could you do this to us? You know, when are we going to get back online? This is the kind of stuff the IT department was dealing with during the time at which they were dealing with everything else. They were dealing with angry employees, angry employees who ultimately 
uh, you know, ended up filing a class action suit against them. So for me, this is the most, the most interesting thing about this is you're only hurting yourself, right? So when you're not taking the effort and time to put all these controls in place and, and all of this, you know, strategy in place to actually respond to disasters, you're, you are impacting your customer relationships. You are impacting your brand. You are impacting your, re your reputation. But you're really impacting your employees. And you shouldn't underestimate how if bad employee morale can come back to hurt you in the long run. So these are all significant business impacts. But um, employee productivity and morale, I think, are the most interesting of, the, of the, the whole chart. So let's go on to the next slide. So today's DR challenge, IT leaders need to extend DR protection to a greater number of apps and systems. Remember back to the slide where we said two-thirds of what we do we think is critical? That means two-thirds of the applications we have in our environment we should have a DR plan for, and definitely, well, and most of them, that those really mission-critical ones should have a continuity plan attached to them. So really, across data centers, dis distributed locations, this is all really important, right? Satellite offices. I don't think any of us actually work in a global or organization where we don't have global offices or in large U.S. organizations that don't have more than one you know, national office. I think this is all really a reality for all of us in IT who are trying to deal with this over the long run. Improve recovery objectives across every classification tier. Um, to seconds and minutes for critical systems. Now think about this. If you were in, if you had managed your own DR plan, and, and listen, I've been a part of enough, you know, DR testing in my day to have aged me, you know, prematurely. But at the end of the day, right, testing that once a year was not helpful. You know, we really couldn't get to the bottom of, you know, could we get to really extreme recovery objectives? And we couldn't, right? That's just the reality of failing over that it takes hours. Sometimes it took all day. All day Saturday was the DR test, right? We would have to, you know, send everybody, a, you know, tell everybody we weren't going to have anything available. We were going to spend all of our Saturday doing this, and hopefully it wouldn't be all of Saturday night because everything would have come back fine. That's really not appropriate. If we're talking mission critical, we're talking seconds to minutes for failover, right? We're talking continuity. We're not actually talking about, all right, I've got to restore from tape. This might take me three weeks. Automate the recovery of applications and systems to ensure continuity of complex business operations. So if you have data being fed from different parts of the organization into a single either mainframe or you know, large application, whether you're doing uh, supply chain management, procurement, uh, if you happen to have a, a large global supply chain, if you're doing you know, any kind of you know, sales from different parts of the world that's all updating to the same database, all of those, I mean, if that database is mission critical, everything supporting it is mission critical, everything feeding it is mission critical, how are you going to manage all that in these, you know, in these far-flung locations in order to create a continuity or disaster recovery plan that is actually going to work, right? And again, minutes, seconds and minutes, not hours and days or weeks, right? So that's a really complicated thing to, to, to actually make work. And I would say probably relatively expensive if you're going to you know, attempt to do it yourself. And ensure it all works when you need it the most. Test, test, test. This is one of the things when Stephanie and I were talking about this, we said, you know, you just can't say it enough. Test, 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 test. It's how you get good at this stuff, right? We can't wait for the one disaster every five years to figure out if we're any good at this, right? We really do need to test it. And like I said, testing in your own DR plan with, with all your own equipment in your own data center and your redundant data center, I mean, that's an all-day thing. I mean, you really only did it once a year because you couldn't get the resources together to do it more often than that. Well, that and your regulator probably said you only needed to do it annually. And I think that's the, the leading thought. I only need to do this once a year. Well, not really. And do it all without breaking the bank. I mean, are you going to manage this across your own environment? If you're a company that, that sells cookware, should you in the, be in the business of, of managing multiple data centers for DR? Yeah, I, I don't know. You sell cookware. Yeah, maybe you should sell cookware and let the DR to the DR folks who really can manage it in minutes and seconds, not hours and days. Let's go on to the next one. So, using the cloud to transform disaster recovery. So, for me, the cloud. You know, we I talk about it a lot in third-party risk management, cloud management. You know, how, how are you going to manage this? But for this. I think for this specifically, I love the cloud for DR, right? Because it's this idea that somebody else has the infrastructure, somebody else has the server infrastructure, the other infrastructure. Really, all I need to figure out is my business case. How much money do I have to spend and how quickly do I need to be up? And that's going to determine how I'm going to look at this. When we think about this from days, hours, minutes, seconds, it all depends on the kind of recovery we're trying to do. Backup from take takes days. 
back up from this could take anywhere from hours to days, depending on how much there is to do. Um, asynchronous replication takes minutes. Synchronous replication takes seconds. But there's a gap between that backup from disk and asynchronous um, replication. That, that how do we get from hours to minutes or days to minutes? And that's, I think, where the cloud actually comes into play, right? That I can back up to the cloud, I can restore to the cloud, I can run from the cloud, and I can put it all back to my data center when I'm able to recover. That's an extraordinary way to look at that. And I really like the cloud for DR. So let's keep going. So cloud-based disaster recovery, you can do it a few ways, right? You can do do-it-yourself cloud DR, using the public cloud to architect a custom solution, leveraging uh, the agility of the speed in the cloud, right? Sounds great. But, um, you know, you are managing it all yourself. This is all the, the licensing and equipment and everything. You're going to have to manage it all yourself. You're using a public cloud to do it, so clearly you're leasing the infrastructure at some point, right? Um, cloud to cloud, so this is the availability to failover services from one cloud data center to another cloud data center. Um, clearly, it would mostly be virtualized and, and moving that stuff around isn't difficult cloud to cloud. And someone else is managing that infrastructure, so it's actually uh, less burden on you and probably less cost. And then DR as a service, prepackaged solutions that provide failover to a cloud environment, which means you're running your data center, they're running their data center, um, you're able to exchange information um, continuously, and when it's time to fail over, that's exactly what you do. You fail over. Um, and, and it's in real time, and depending on how much you want to pay for this and what kind of recovery objective you want, um, you can do this in seconds or minutes. So very interesting. So let's go to the next one. So DR as a service is at a glance. You have production data centers, right? So you have a bunch of servers that are attached to primary storage. The primary storage, you can back up the storage and let the storage back up to the cloud provider. Um, you would do this um, through a replication of continuously copy physical or virtual apps and its data to the cloud. Failover is automatic to standby VMs or VMs that are restarted. So it's an automatic failover. When you have a failure at one, it just flips everything over to the other data center, and you're doing that um, via the primary storage. You can also do, you can back up to your primary storage or back up to manage backup appliance. The provider backs up physical or virtual machine images and its data to its cloud, and it boots up from restored VMs. So, so the managed backup appliance is what's talking to the cloud provider. And that's another way to look at that from, production, from a production data center point of view. So let's go on to the next slide. Uh, multiple replication options exist for DR as a service, and this is something you have to take into consideration, right? Um, SAN to SAN replication, that actually requires matching hardware because you're going from SAN to SAN. Uh, host replication, uh, that would be agent-based as well as the hypervisor replication. Uh, and those are actually just replicating constantly to um, other hosts. And when we're talking about actual uh, replication from a software perspective, software versus hardware replication. Software replication is hardware agnostic. So I don't have to actually go from one data center where my hardware is one standard. I may be all Dell, but I'm going over to another data center. That data center doesn't have to house all Dell. The actual the software is obscuring that layer from the from the uh, from the DR you know software. So there's really no need to do that. So you don't have to create a second data center that happens to be in the cloud managed by somebody else. Let the cloud provide provide the data center and you know synchronized through the actual software piece of it. So uh, there's lots of different flavors to this stuff. There's lots of different ways to look at it. And quite frankly, depending on you know, how often you need to change updated, how often you, know, you want asynchronous or synchronous, how much out of sync you're allowed to be, it kind of determines, and how much money you want to spend, will determine which of these you're actually going to go after. So let's go to the next slide. It supports a wide range of objectives as well, right? So you have a hot cloud site. And so at the top of the list, this is the stuff that costs more money. And the bottom of the list is the stuff that costs less money. And I think it's, it's self-explanatory when you hear what you're getting for the money that you're going to spend. A hot cloud site, recovery cloud, um, is running replica VMs to the production site using real-time replication. So a recovery time objective would be zero to two hours. And the, re the recovery point objective is zero to 24 hours, right? So I want to get everything up and running anywhere between one minute and two hours. Everything has to be back online. And I can't lose data from more than zero to 24 hours because of the, the flip over in the sink, right? So that's a hot cloud site. That's about as good as it's going to get from a DR or business continuity perspective. And you're going to pay for it. I mean, there's a lot of, of things to be taken into consideration, availability, you know, dedicated bandwidth. Uh, dedicated servers. There, there's a lot going on there, so that's what you want to think about. A warm cloud site, the recovery cloud contains offline copies of virtual machines that can be spun up during disasters or tests. 
So the recovery time objective there is zero, two to six hours because it's ratcheting up a little bit, right? But the recovery point objective is between zero and 24 hours. And then a cold cloud site, the recovery cloud contains backups of production systems that must be first rehydrated. So you've got to do another update and then turned on VMs before it can recover and, and, and can occur. So the, the recovery time objective there would be four to 24 hours and the uh, recovery point objective can be 24 to 48 hours. Here's what I like about this from a triage perspective, though. If we think about risk and we think about continuity and disaster recovery from a risk perspective, you know, those mission-critical applications may need to be online at a hot cloud site, but maybe we're talking about the low-risk system or the systems that don't, you know, consider the impact of employees, customers, partners, and things like that just some ancillary systems that we may not have to get up on time, those we can put in a, a cold cloud site and say, well, those ones we're not going to worry about like we're going to worry about that. So I can actually tier how I'm going to pay, thing, pay for things based on the tier of the applications that I'm dealing with. Next slide. So the benefits of the cloud in general, right? Speed. Cloud solutions can be deployed in a matter of weeks versus on-prem solutions that can take months to years, right? I mean, if you've ever built a second data center, you know what that takes, right? Um, so those are years of, that's a year of planning. It's probably four or five months of execution and probably another three or four months of troubleshooting because it never goes right the first time. I've done enough of those to know that too. Economies of scale. Cloud providers have massive environments that allow them to drive down their infrastructure costs. That's always a good thing. Agility. Cloud providers are consistently expanding and adding additional capacity so you don't have to worry about the ability to expand. All of a sudden, you know, that control of, of um, making sure you have enough capacity is no longer your problem, especially from a DR perspective. So that's really great. Ability to leverage the core expertise of the provider. The core competency of a cloud service provider is to deliver infrastructure services quickly and efficiently. It's all they do, all day long, that's what they do. And there's something to be said for if you sell pots and pans, should you be in the business of you know, data infrastructure. I'm lucky, I was in a company that sold pots and pans and they really thought that their physical infrastructure was important. So, uh, but I think today I would rethink that. So better functionality for less cost. Most of the time, uh, you essentially only pay for storage resources, turning on a VMs, only in the event of a disaster or a test, and there's little or no upfront capital investment. So if you've ever, if you ever duplicated your SAN, you'll know that in the production data center, it was $14 million, and you think, okay, so the secondary data center isn't going to be that bad. And then you're staring at the bill for $10 million, and you're thinking, why? Why am I doing this, right? That's the truth, though. I mean, that's what a truth so You've got to put a lot up front. You've got to budget for this stuff. Bank of America, I think many years back, they have four data centers. They run out of them quarterly, so they fail over to each data center once a quarter. That's how they test their DR plan to make sure everything's working. It's seamless to me as a customer, but it was a $1 billion investment for that bank. So that's how expensive this stuff gets when you do it in-house. Um, so easier, more frequent, and less um, expensive testing. Oh, better functionality for less cost. So there's little no up or no upfront investment. Easier, more frequent, and less expensive testing. Testing can be automated and is non-disruptive. What? Isn't that awesome, right? You can do testing whenever you want. You don't have to bring the whole team in on a Sunday. You can actually do DR testing in reasonable hours with reasonable results and ability to kind of you know, monitor that stuff going forward. So this annual test that required a ton of work and planning kind of goes away and it's replaced with functional testing that we really should have been doing from the beginning but never had the resources to actually accomplish it. Um, more flexible short-term contracts with fast time to market. It gives you the ability to adapt to a changing IT environment and business needs. And deployments are measured in weeks, not months to years. And pay-as-you-go pricing, on-demand pay-per-use resources that remove the initial investment costs and inflexible contractual agreements while still um, delivering recovery capabilities. If you think about um, traditional uh, disaster recovery without the cloud, you know, you were in a five to ten year contract. Those contracts are really restrictive. Um, and it was because they were making an investment on your behalf in that data center. They were reproducing your environment one more time in their data center. It's not how cloud works. Cloud is actually much more accessible. The contracts seem to be at least you know, annual contracts. They won't be three, five, seven, ten years. Um, and I think that makes it a, a better competitive environment definitely for the customer, but it, it's also really a, a good way of planning that going forward. A ten-year investment in a third-party uh, DR program, I think the cloud's taking that away now. So what are Stephanie's recommendations? So from the current offering, when you're, when you're looking at a key vendor, what are the considerations you should put in place? If you were going to create an RFP today, what should be in it, right? So 
So understand the DR is a service offering. So how are the services packaged? Recovery objective capabilities, what are the range of the RTO or RPO capabilities? Um, application and platform support, can the su provider support my IT environment? So things that are interesting about me, can, can they support that, right? Data transfer technologies, what are the replication and backup options? Uh, how do we feed the initial copies of the production data? Am I throwing up a line and I'm sending it all over? Are you mailing me an appliance and I'm going to back up to that and I'm going to send it off to my DR as a service provider? How is that going to work? It's important to understand that, right? Data resiliency. Uh, how does the provider ensure data in the cloud is not lost, corrupted, or et cetera? Uh, uh, risk mitigation. As I said before, I'm a risk management person, so I could talk for days about this. How does the provider mitigate oversubscription risk, right? So how does the provider deal with the fact that it has 1,000 uh, you know, customers in one geographical location? What do they do if that data center goes down? Can those thousands be repurposed in less than a minute? Like that's really important to understand because that's the bill of goods that you're buying, and so you better understand that that's the right thing and that the vendor can actually meet that requirement. And security, how does the provider protect sensitive data? Um, that's important if you're in a heavily regulated environment, or even not, right? I don't think Sony's a heavily regulated environment, but I'm betting there's some stuff they would have wanted to keep private. And again, that wasn't their third party that did that. That was their own fault. Next one. Plant service enhancements. So what new enhancements are on the horizon? That's always a good question to ask, no matter what RFP you're doing. Pricing, SLAs and contract terms. What are the range of the RTOs and RPOs? Scale, can the provider support my IT environment? Supporting declarations, what is their level of expertise in failovers and failbacks? What is their success level? It's a relevant question to ask. How good are you at this, right? Um, install base and growth, how many customers do they have? Geographical location, what are the regions in which they operate? And partnerships, what are the providers' technology and service partnerships? Because listen, from a third-party risk management perspective, you know, they are now responsible for your uh, ability to recover from a catastrophic event. Um, if they are not, if they are outsourcing that to other third-party providers, you want to make sure that they have a sound third-party risk management program. I mean, you can't reach into their providers and say, "I'm coming to audit you," but you should hope that like, you should have proof at least that they have a strong third-party risk management program. And in some regulatory cases, banking, healthcare, it's it's imperative that you do it. So next one. Additional considerations, uh, use, it, use DR as a service strategically. Consider that it might fit into your recovery tiers for specific locations. It doesn't have to be a strategy for all systems. Remember we were talking about the far-flung regional offices or you know, any place like that where it's one IT guy and he has a, a tape deck? I mean, that's a great opportunity to move to the cloud and start doing business continuity and disaster recovery for that as well, right? It's, it's, closes that gap too. I mean, I've seen, I'm an auditor, I've seen everything from we put the tape in a Tupperware container in case the sprinklers go on in here. Yeah, the data center had sprinklers. Or, um, you know, I've, I've seen them do things like, oh yeah, it's in the trunk of my car um, in a safe. That, that way if I'm ever rear-ended, the you know, safe will protect the stuff. And occasionally you'll see people who actually rotated their tapes off-site to a safe deposit box in a bank. Like I've seen all kinds of craziness going on, and I don't think that that's actually a good way to recover from a disaster. So think about that strategically. Think of the places where that's happening today, and think that maybe there's a better way to do it now with the cloud. Not think. I, I, I kind of know. Understanding bandwidth um, requirements. Work with the provider to understand how much bandwidth is required to support replication and reduce the impact of latency. Um, this is important because your total cost of ownership will include your bandwidth, and that bandwidth, whether it's asynchronous, synchronous, you've got to figure out what that's going to be because you want to make sure you're meeting your backup windows clearly, right? Because it's constantly happening. You don't want to impact the rest of the organization um, when it comes to your voice over IP or your data or your you know, video conferencing or whatever else it may be. <coughs> test frequently. <laughs> Everybody takes this one. Test frequently and then test some more, right? You must test recovery, run exercise, train staff, and work with providers to make sure you can truly meet business requirements for recovery. Again, we don't want to find out that day the worst day of our professional lives that we can't actually pull this off. That is not the day to find that out. You don't want to have that conversation with the CEO, right? So this is test, 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 test. And in a DR as a service environment, you can do that often. And depending on your contract and, and how much support that that uh, provider will give you, it, it actually makes a big difference, right? Your ability to recover is going to rest on the shoulders of your ability to test. And work with your sourcing pros to understand licensing, licensing implications. Uh, there's licensing considerations to be had here in that you have an entire production data center, 
and a, a redundant data center that's not actually doing anything related to production, which means you may be paying for licensing for your production environment, but you may not want to pay it until you actually use your DR environment as a production environment. This is things that your, your procurement professionals can actually work with you on, your sourcing folks, and figure out, is there a way to do that? Is there a way not to pay for Oracle nine times if I don't have to pay for Oracle nine times because you know, nine of, eight of the nine are actually you know, a DR plan? There's ways to figure that stuff out, and it's definitely worth doing. So work with your sourcing professionals to understand that stuff, and make sure you take it into consideration now, not later. So that's what I, that was my contribution. So thank you, everyone. I, I'll turn it back to, uh, I guess, David, or I guess David will take it. But um, thank you yep. so much. If you have any questions or you ha have anything to add, you're free to email me. I appreciate that. And I'll be, for, I'll be sure to forward that on to, uh, to Stephanie. So I'll give thank a you. turn it over to Mark. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Renee. Thank you. Uh, certainly very interesting. And next up is Mark Jameson, Vice President of Disaster Recovery Solutions at Acronis. Whenever you're ready, Mark. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, you know, first of all, I'd like to just echo what Renee ha has said. That definitely, uh, spending over the past decade in the disaster recovery business, I see what uh, she's been talking about. You know, she's spot on in that, and it's been exciting watching where the industry has been going and the type of technologies that uh, can be applied to solve a lot of the challenges that were there. Uh, what I'm going to do is spend a few minutes uh, to talk about the. The challenges that, uh, just a second, give a little feedback. Uh, the challenges that we, okay, excuse me. The challenges that we have seen in the industry and, and how Acronis has, uh, you know, worked to protect these, uh, these uh, and solve these challenges. Next, Dave. So what I'm going to talk a little bit is about, you know, Acronis as a whole right now. So we're not just about disaster recovery. As you probably know Acronis in the past, uh, we have uh, uh, looked at protecting your entire environment from the uh, mobile devices to laptops to uh, workstations to the critical servers in your data center. Um, yeah, we, we look at the whole environment. Uh, next, David. And we, and we use our, our uh, Acronis Any Data Engine where we can capture and store the data. We're able to recover it, we're managing it, and then provide our clients access to it uh, is how is the underlying technology that's used. Uh, what I'd like to do in the couple slides I'm going to talk through is really focus in on the data center and the disaster recovery aspect, uh, in particular, you know, backup and disaster recovery. Next, David. So, you know, it's interesting. You know, I mentioned uh, being in the industry for the past decade plus, uh, and, and, you know, it, it's really been watching the different architectures evolve and, and, and the different uh, resources that companies had to solve the disaster recovery problems. If you look at the bottom, you know, uh, do-it-yourself was actually, you know, Renee spent a lot of time talking about it, and it really was the primary way people did it in the past, uh, and, and it still is a, a way a lot of companies do it. However, with the advent of, of, of new services uh, in this area, we really think that there are some better ways to accomplish this uh, uh, for your business. You know, the other things that were traditionally used, whether it was just using a colo for a second site and leveraging their infrastructure potentially, you have the traditional leg legacy uh, disaster recovery providers, whether that be SunGuard or IBM. Uh, and then it started to change, especially on the low end of the, the market. You started seeing on-premise appliances, uh, you know, being populated out there, and then the ability to take those on-premise appliances and move the data elsewhere. Uh, and then, of course, the advent of the public cloud really, you know, made for some strong disaster recovery alternatives. And, and we really get to where we're at now, where you have, you know, actually, you know, the, the, when you look at the disaster recovery as a service base, it's being approached from two different perspectives. It's being approached from those companies who started in disaster recovery and those companies who started in backup and really looking at, you know, bringing to market a solution that addresses both the backup and disaster recovery needs. Next, David. And, and that's something that uh, Acronis has done. We, you know, with the uh, acquisition of Enscale by Acronis, we really have focused in on you know, delivering a true disaster recovery and backup solution built into one. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. Next slide. 
So this is a, a slide that actually should be a little familiar. Renee uh, shows something very similar. If you look at the bottom left, it shows you know uh, you know tape backup, no recovery. That's uh, you know very common, very traditional. You know uh, low technology, low availability. And on the upper up right side, you have this replicated, always on, synchronous environment with some dedicated equipment, and and it tended to be you know give you high availability, but very expensive. Uh, you know complexity in managing it. And then below that, you, you really, the, for, for a long time, the best thing you had was you know, maybe some type of vaulting solution where you had to rehydrate the data, and it didn't allow you to get that you know, minutes or hours recovery. It took multiple hours. And we really saw a gap there at Enscale, and that's where we developed our solution to address that gap. So you know, one of the things I want to point out, though, it's just not the solution itself. So while we address and filling that gap with our disaster recovery to service, Solution. We actually provide a service that covers all three of these upper end. You know, whether it be backup only, uh, you know, into the cloud, whether it be the disaster recovery service with a cold or warm uh, recovery servers, or whether it be always on active environments, whether it be Active Directory running in the cloud, whether it be SQL mirroring or SQL log shipping running in the cloud. The service that we provide, you know, encompasses all three of these. Uh, uh, aspects and, and any service provider you work with should be able to have that ability to not just provide a niche solution, but to meet all of your uh, disaster recovery needs. This goes back to what Renee was talking about. You know, you, you, you look at the tiered criticality of your your servers and your applications, and this and our solution here enables you to put them into the right bucket uh, to service them. Next slide. So I want to take just a few minutes going over, you know, the disaster recovery solution, more from the standpoint of, uh, you know, having you look at the type of things that you should see in a, a disaster recovery as a service solution. Very critical. Uh, on the upper left, you see we have a recovery console. This is an access anywhere. It has all the automation built in. Really super easy to use. Uh, intuitive. It does not require uh, technical resources to actually do recoveries or failovers. You then see that we do local site protection. Uh, we actually have three transports. We use NetApp, we use Falcon Store, and now our flagship Acronis uh, product. And we back it up into the cloud, and then we also do disaster recovery in the cloud. You actually can do disaster recovery both in the cloud and on the local appliances uh, where, where you have appliances installed. So what are some of the business problems that we address and any service provider should also address? As I said before, you know, we need to make it simple. Get rid of the complexity. You know, in our environment, you're able to spin up any servers in three clicks, and, and it's very intuitive, self-service. It does not take an IT expert to actually do the recovery of a data center. Financial impact. Um, for us, it's, it, we look at it in two ways. One is it's an all-in-one solution, so uh, you get backup and DR together, so there's not two different solutions that you have to have. This provides the whole solution for you. And then, as Renee had pointed out, it's you know it's an OpEx pay-as-you-go pay model uh, that allows uh, companies to invest you know as they need it and, and uh, invest in only what they need. On the other side here, you, you on the right side, you see the impact of time. This is, and we also have our active always on uh, you know server bar. The other thing that uh, Renee spent some time talking about was anytime you know or testing. And we really, you know, take this to heart and, and really look at how we address it. So uh, we actually offer three different things in the testing environment. First, we allow our clients to test any three servers anytime they want. Um, they uh, they can do that in the morning. They can do it in the evening. They can be testing different servers. It doesn't matter. And our definition of testing is they can actually use it to do uh, uh, software release testing. It, it doesn't have to be purely for DR. The other thing is that um, it's uh, every eight weeks we allow our clients to open up their entire test environment, so if uh, they can test everything they have, and also we offer something called automated testing, where our system will actually test it for you and give you the results of, of how this solution did or how the servers did. Business risk, you know, guaranteed capacities is one of the things we bring to the table. We do provide guaranteed capacities within regional zones. We're in uh, uh, you know, very secure data centers. And, and most importantly, we have a 24 by 7 support team to be there to help you when, when there's a need and, and, and help you through not only the day-to-day -day stuff, but in the event of a disaster. Next slide. 
So, you know, and not only is uh, Acronos in our data centers in uh, North America, but you can see we actually we have two in North America, and we have other data centers throughout the world. Uh, so we truly are a global company and, you know, offer our backup and disaster recovery service throughout the globe uh, to our client base. And with that, uh, I will turn back over to uh, David and to introduce our client. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, next up is David Benton, Vice President of Technology at Austin Ventures. Um, David, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, uh, David, uh, last time uh, when we spoke, you pointed out that um, uh, backup and DR are required for customer trust and overall business continuity. Uh, let me ask you, where do you see key challenges uh, to achieve full IT protection, specifically in Windows, Linux environment, and uh, public clouds? Well, Rene actually uh, hit exactly what I was after. So back in 2008, we started trying to find that gap box she had listed. Um, we were fully virtualized. Every, you know, everything was there. The disaster recovery, though, was constantly a pain point, um, particularly trying to maintain in-house skill sets um, customers, as she pointed out, just did not care anymore about uh, your uptime or any pain points you're having. They just expect it to be up, and they expect to be able to get their data whenever they need it, whether whether you know it was on their uh, responsibility to actually maintain their backups or not. They still expected you to. Uh, big differences in uh, the Linux versus the Windows world that we were in that I could never figure out is Linux, there's a, a common approach now of burn and build, where if you have a problematic machine, you can just burn it and reconfigure automatically. Windows is still not there. It's coming along with PowerShell and their DSE configuration, um, but it's, it's, it's still got a ways to go. So having, having a way to get those VMs spun up quickly and have them off-site was a very, very big pain point for us because we still, even though we're smaller, we still need to look like the big guys and we have white glove service for a lot of people, so you know, that's what they expect. The thing we realized though is DR and business continuity is clearly not a value add for us. So rather than maintaining it, uh, I went on the hunt for a few years for somebody that could basically take over business continuity and DR as a, as a service. It took a long time to figure that out and to, fi and to find somebody, um, but we went ahead and uh, start, you know, put out RFIs repeatedly, a lot of which were on the slides that Renee had. So that was kind of interesting, watching, watching my own numbers from back in 2010, I think, is when we found uh, Nscaled. And the beauty of it was that we were able to uh, outsource the DR, not have to maintain those skill sets, and, and still have those uptimes. So we didn't have to worry about the colo investment, buying all the hardware anymore, or paying an exorbitant fee for a lease-type arrangement through one of the old colos back then that offered that. Um, and from a you know, requirement standpoint, we needed streamlined approach. We needed to not be uh, reliant on in-house. One of the biggest things we found on in-house was if there was an actual, uh, like a weather-related emergency and our systems went down, the problem was our people were busy dealing with their families. So getting them to, to pay attention to you know, the business needs was kind of hard, <laughs> which is understandable. So being able to have those, those resources elsewhere made it a lot easier just to pull the trigger and, and you know, spin up our environments, letting somebody else take care of it. Uh, will you go to the next? So deployment on Nscaled was actually quite easy. We spent a lot of time, a lot more time than necessary uh, is what we discovered. Uh, Renee commented about relying on third party as a you know from a risk standpoint, and I agree with her on that. But where we mitigated that was just through frequent testing as verification, so that in the end we didn't really have to rely on what the underlying infrastructure was so much as that that Nscaled could execute on the services we needed. The one place we did still focus though is on the partnerships within Nscaled. Um, as in back in the, you know, when it was all Falcon Store, that sort of thing, uh, just to make sure that there were long enough term arrangements and agreements that we weren't going to have a sudden shift where Nscaled would have to call and say their partnership just expired with Falcon Store and suddenly we were going, you know, jumping hurdles in order to make those changes. Um, uh, David, let, let, me, let me just quickly explain to our listeners who, those who are new to Acronis, uh, and oh. may be confused with you using Nscaled name. 
Uh, well, right. back back then in 2010, when Aston Ventures uh, acquired the solution, it was still uh, n scaled uh, by n scaled, and then of course uh, last year in September, Acronis had acquired n scaled. So now it is it is Acronis fully integrated into uh, our um, technology. But obviously, <coughs> for for Dave, it's more natural to use n scaled name. So we'll we'll let him do that. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. I, I even commented to you that I was probably going to do that. <laughs> right, right. And that's uh, sorry. Totally I will, fine. I will try to start saying Acronis. <laughs> it's just all happening. <laughs> um, anyway, so yeah, so environment that we, we started out with and, and kind of maintain still. We, we add and remove systems as needed, but this is kind of our, our existing infrastructure with the ESX hosts and Windows servers. We do some, you know, the, the critical stuff gets backed up and has a RTO and RPO compliance, and then we just have some that are just local backups. Uh, for things that we would need to need to replace quickly, example, a simple thing like a voicemail system. Honestly, if we lose it because there's a major, major disaster, then we can live with it. But if it's just that server fell down, then we need to, you know, it needs to be back up quicker. And the local appliance is what helps us with that. And again, it's a system that we did not have to deal with. You know, the technology of replicating a, a NetApp or something like that. We just got the box, plugged it in, configured it with their help on the phone, and off, you know, off and running we were. Can I go next? Okay. And uh, what advice can you give us? Uh, <clears throat> yeah. So, so the advice I would say is we actually um, have turned it into a black box for, from the uh, disaster recovery side. We have everything documented as much as needed for just about anybody. Um, we can have our our COO can declare an emergency, and there's a list of phone numbers. He makes, you know, he can make phone calls if he wants. And there's documentation out there for um, Acronis to be able to spin up the entire environment. We have, you know, some scripts that run on it. We have one active server that runs out there all the time, uh, primarily for that purpose. And the, you know, now if we have an event, it is, it is quite simply anybody, you know, whoever's on the list can make a phone call. Uh, the Acronis guys know everything that needs to be done. We keep that documentation up. They know which scripts to run to spin up all the servers. And what used to be, where that gap that Renee talked about, what used to be days for us to to recover, like we could recover point in time, but if we had true failure, you know, server failure problems or, or data center problems, you're talking days to recover. And the cost was just not, you know, we couldn't come up with a good way to rationalize the cost. However, pushing it out to um, Acronis, we were able to easily justify spinning that up. And we, you know, we were able to test for a while there. We were testing testing, every, I think, four times a year, uh, a complete recovery of everything mission critical. And, you know, what used to be, like I said, days now took, I think the maximum we ever went was one hour and 15 minutes. And that was while we were still streamlining the process. Uh, now I think it's around 40 minutes uh, to have our entire environment back up and running. That's, that's email, that's fund management software, you know, SQL databases, that's the whole package. So lessons learned, I would say, Pay attention to your process um, and treat the draft as what it is, is a, a black box service. Uh, don't, don't get mired down in the details like I, of course, had from prior experience in disaster recovery and business continuity. Rely on the folks that that's what they do all day. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. That's um, absolutely amazing. Um, glad to have you here. And at this point, uh, we will um, open it up for Q&A. Uh, we, we already have one question here. Um, this is from um, from uh, Eric Fletcher, uh, and uh, I will ask Mark to cover it. So uh, the question is: Is the solution is the solution appropriate for? Fortune 500 and multinationals. Basically, what is the target customer, target market for for this kind of solution, Mark? Yeah, um, David. We, you know, we actually have clients uh, ranging from the low end of the enterprise, uh, you know, with uh, uh, you know 50,000 plus employees, all the way down to the high high end of the S of the SMB. You know, so um, you know, for those uh, companies that really look at disaster recovery as not just recovering data, but actually getting servers and business back in, in business in, in a cloud environment. 
is where really where our focus point, and that really is, like I said, the uh, mid market up into the low end of the enterprise. Thank you, thank you, Mark. Um, <clears throat> the next question probably should go to Dave, Dave Benton. Uh, the question is, uh, what do you have on site installed from Enscaled or Acronis, rather? So perhaps you could explain what kind of an appliance and, and how many of them do you have? Uh, at this point, we are we have uh, one white box appliance. Uh, it was provided by Enscaled through a hardware manufacturer that they used. Um, well, back when it was Enscaled, sorry, I did it again. Uh, and that's used for all of the local uh, backups, of course, and then from there it gets compressed, deduped, and, or deduped, and uh, encrypted and sent out to the Enscaled cloud. So that's that's all we keep on site uh, from Enscaled itself, or Acronis itself. Okay, okay. And and is it is it all the same appliance since since when you first installed Enscaled? Yeah, I'm, I'm still running on the same box. We we upgraded storage at one point, but. It just keeps running. I mean, it's it's a big storage unit, so there's not much to it. Okay. Uh, another question I have from uh, Tom Johnson, uh, it's probably to Dave as well. Uh, have you, uh, how often do you test? Well, that kind of goes back to Renee's slide. Test, test, test. Right. So, uh, how right. often do you test? It depends. So, since uh, it's changed over time, as uh, as and skill became a Cronus and some of the testing changed. We used to test a lot. Uh, of course, we, we and other customers started, I think, over you know, creating provisioning problems <laughs> for, for, the start, uh, for their cloud. So we've scaled it back. We do at least two full-on tests of everything. You know, we, we, spin, as, we treat it as, the, as if the data center went down. We spin up everything uh, once every six months. And then we'll do intermittent testing with, you know, SQL servers, that sort of thing, just as we make changes. So if we make changes on the production system after everything replicates, we'll go, you know, we'll schedule some time like a week or two later to spin it up out there just to make sure that everything's still talking. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we are getting close to <clears throat> to the top of the hour, and uh, I don't want to keep people longer than necessary. Uh, please feel free to send us more questions. Uh, we'll be happy to answer anything over email. Thank you again to all our speakers. And uh, as a reminder, all registrants will receive a link to the on-demand session uh, replay that you can uh, share with your colleagues. And again, thank you, everybody, and have a nice day.